As I mention every time I bring up these guys, the Vampire Coast have the best theming in the game and that continues to their roster. You really feel like an undead pirate faction with the sheer amount of gunpowder and barnacle covered monsters you have at your disposal. They do come with a bit of a weird playstyle, but weird doesn't necessarily mean bad and they can be pretty powerful if used correctly. First let's go through the pros and cons of the roster overall. First of all the pros, they have an overwhelming amount of missile power that can focus fire down pretty much anything you aim it at from a very large range. They also have a limited pool of magical laws, but all of them are pretty top notch. And they also have an excellent monster roster, both for the front lines and for more ranged firepower. As for the cons, just like the vampire counts, if a unit breaks it will start to fall apart, so losing the battle normally means losing the army. They also have a total lack of proper front lines, and even though you can get around it, if you're heavily outnumbered and enemies are fast, you will struggle. And finally, nearly all the missile units fire in a straight line, so need a clear line of sight to fire, which can become a pain in the ass to manage in more intense battles. Just before we get into the units, we first have a word from our sponsor, Skillshare. At this point, Skillshare and I, we're pretty tight, so you probably know all about their thousands of online classes that can help you learn a new skill or improve an old one. They got classes for pretty much anything you can think of that's creative, like writing, cinematography, and post-production. Some of the skills I used to make videos every single day, I learn on Skillshare. One class I've completed recently is Mastering Productivity by Thomas Frank. It basically goes through how to create a system of organization that means you get what you need to get done without having to think about it, and you'll always know what needs doing next. But of course, if this isn't your thing, there are literally thousands more to choose from, so you'll definitely be able to find something that you like. On top of all these classes, Skillshare is also ad-free, it gets updated every month with more new classes, and there are subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. If you'd like to try Skillshare yourself, then click the link in the description, and the first 1,000 of you to do so will get one month of Skillshare totally free. Huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring the video and supporting the channel. Really do appreciate it. And now, let's get into these units. First up, we have the Lords. And first up, we have Luther Harkon. He's a melee expert, duelist, is aquatic, and can fire whilst moving. He also has disrupted, imbued attacks and missiles, which increase miscast chance and reduces physical resistance on targets hit. And when his mind is healed, he has access to the Law of the Deep. Luther really is a jack of all trades once he has his mind in check. He has great melee stats and decent damage, even though it's not overly armor piercing. He has powerful armor piercing missiles that can deal great damage from afar, and once he's in control he'll get that lore of the deeps going and be a spellcaster on top of everything else. Aside from the spells, you want to use him to focus down single targets like other characters with his missiles first, and then in melee combat once they close in on him. His high range damage will soften them up and make the following melee combat much more in his favor. Just be cautious when sending him against high armor, as his damage may struggle to punch through. He can also do okay on the front lines, but again, his total lack of armor piercing damage and medium armor mean he won't last very long in the super late game. He only has one choice of mount, the Death Shriek Terrorgeist. This drops his melee stats and some armor, but he becomes a speedy flying monster with high damage in large area attacks on top of his ranged prowess. He also gains the Death Shriek ability, which deals high armor piercing damage and is best used in a single target. This does also make him into a big target for ranged, but the speed helps to keep him safe. Next up we have the Count Noctilus. He is armored and deals armor piercing anti-large damage, is a melee expert as well as aquatic. He has access to a mix of the laws of shadows and vampires. Noxalus is the frontline's expert of the Vampire Coast. He has decent armor and pretty good melee stats alongside high armor piercing and anti-large damage. This makes him into a devastating frontline's battler versus infantry, large targets for other characters as his damage will plunge through and he'll keep himself alive while doing it. Of course, if he gets totally surrounded by high armor piercing damage, then he will start to fall down fast, so make sure to keep him supported and don't let him get totally swarmed if you can help it. He also has that powerful mixed law, so toss out spells when never needed to deal devastating damage, heal your troops, or something in between. He also only has one mount, the Necrofex Colossus. This drops some defense and armor to grant him a ton of HP, devastating missile damage, and armor piercing area attacks. Again, it does make him quite a large target for ranged, but with his massive range and firing arc, he can stay well back if needed. Next we have Aranus Assault Spite. She deals armor piercing anti-large damage, is a melee expert, and aquatic. She has no spells, and Aranessa has always been a bit of a question mark for me. She has low armor and 20% physical resistance, so he's not exactly what you'd call tanky in any regard. She does have high melee stats as well as good damage with armor piercing and anti-large, but why she never felt very good to me. She could be a decent frontline's battler, similar to Noctilus, though not quite as tanky. She could also be a great duelist with those outstanding melee stats and high damage. But for some reason, whenever I've used her, she's always felt kind of weak and like most things can take her out without too much trouble. Send her in to do either of these things, but keep a close eye on her as she can go down very quickly once she starts to take damage. She only has access to one mount, the Rotting Promethean. This drops a melee attack to gain a nice bit of armor and a whopping one speed. It still makes her into a large target though, but not massive, so just be careful of getting swarmed. Now, our final legendary lord is Silostria Deerfan. 
She's a spellcaster, is ethereal, causes terror, and has enthralling attacks which reduce the target's attack, and has the Ghost of the Past ability. This allows her to summon a unit of damned knights, which can be upgraded via skills to summon more powerful units. She also has access to the Law of the Deeps. Of course, being ethereal means that Silostra relies on physical resistance to be tanky, and has no armor and not a ton of HP. This makes her decently hard to take out for anything that doesn't have magical damage, but if anything does, yeah, she's going to drop like a sack of taters. You want to send her in versus anything that's low at non-magical damage and have her do some damage of her own with decent melee stats and magical armor piercing damage as well as those enthralling attacks. She should do decent work here, just be careful she doesn't get focused or surrounded as the resistance can only do so much when there are so many hits coming her way. She also has that Lore of the Deep so can deal some great damage and drop buffs and debuffs onto the battlefield to turn the tide into her favor. And finally, she can use those Ghosts of the Past to provide cav spots on a faction that has no cav, so that's pretty neat. And finally, she does have the one mount, the Rotting Leviathan. This loses the magical enthralling attacks to gain increases to nearly every other stat. She becomes a giant monster with massive area armor piercing attacks, but is of course a massive target, so hide away from enemy range and anti-large whenever possible. We now come to our non-legendary lords. First up, we have the Polearm Vampire Fleet Captain. These are spellcasters, deal armor piercing anti-large damage in melee, and are aquatic. They can come with the Law of Deaths, Vampires or Deeps. These basically perform like Noctilus with slightly less armor and damage. They still have nice melee stats and armor piercing anti-large damage so will do some great work on the front lines versus pretty much anything you can think of. Still don't let them get bogged down and surrounded as their slight armor loss means they die even faster especially later into the game. It can also bring one of those three juicy laws so pick your favorites and rain spell spot down onto the battlefield wherever needed for even more value. Send them in and keep them casting and you can't go far wrong. They also have the one mount, the Rotting Promethean. And our final lord is the Pistol Vampire Fleet Captain. These are spellcasters, have armor piercing missiles, are aquatic and can fire whilst moving, and they have access to the same three laws as the pole arms. These are very similar to Luther Harkon with their mix of front lines and range capabilities. They are slightly worse in most stats but have the same range and only a little less ammo and damage. You still want to use them the same to target single entities and soften them up with missiles before engaging them in melee combat. Be careful of high armor or high damage since they lack armor piercing and don't have the most themselves so will go down fast when focused down. Of course they still have those three laws of magic to choose from so grab your preferred one and drop spells whenever needed to keep up the pressure. And finally, they have the same one mount, the Rotting Promethean. Next up we have our heroes, and first up we have the only legendary hero which belongs to Silas Tradefan, Robert Bartholomew. He's shielded, deals anti-large damage, and is ethereal. He also has magical and frostbite attacks which slow the target's hit. He has no spells and similar to Silostra, this guy relies on physical resistance to survive and as such has no armor of his own. This makes him decently tough versus non-magical damage and incredibly weak versus magical. He does decent damage with a bonus versus large, melee stats aren't half bad either. You want to use him to get into the front lines and do some decent damage versus anything without magical damage there. Don't let him get surrounded as he will still go down fast if totally focused. He also has the one mount, the Bardered Warhorse. This gains him a ton of speed and charge bonus, makes him into a cycle charging lord rather than sustained combat. He does start with this mount equipped, so this is the playstyle you want to adopt right out of the gate. Just don't let him get stuck and pinned down in combat, otherwise the large hitbox will come back and bite him in the ass. Next up we have the Vampire Fleet Captain. These are spellcasters, decent melee combatants and aquatic. They have the same three lore choices as the lords. These are very average fighters with decent melee stats and high non-armor piercing damage, but their low armor stops them from being effective versus anything with even a slightly large amount of damage. Of course, their real power is their spell casting, so get them into combat versus the weakest units you can find, and have them cast spells wherever needed to provide damage and or support depending on your chosen law. Don't let them get surrounded and pinned down, otherwise focusing them down is a piece of cake. You also have the one mount, the Rotting Promethean. Next we have the Mongol Haunters. These deal armor piercing anti-infantry damage, cause terror, have stalk, as well as frostbite attacks. These are your sneaky assassin heroes that can creep around the battlefield and attack lords and heroes when they least expect it. They have great damage but low melee stats so can be a little volatile in how much damage they are dealing. They also aren't the toughest with pretty low armor so if they get seen and focused with melee or ranged it can spell for a pretty rapid disaster. Keep them sneaking and hidden to focus down key targets and pull them out if they start to take too much damage themselves. Or be simple and send them into the front lines versus low damage and they'll do just fine as well. And our final heroes are the Gunnery Whites. These are ballistic experts, deal armor piercing missile damage and are aquatic. These guys are honestly made by the abilities they can get once they level up in the campaign. Without them they are pretty basic ranged heroes. They do have nice damage and a decent range but can only hit a single target so focusing on single entities is the way to go to maximize their value. In melee, they are pretty useless with low armor, melee stats, and mediocre non-armor piercing damage. Keep them on the backline supporting ranged troops once they get those abilities and firing whenever possible and avoiding melee at all costs. They also have the one mount, the Rotting Promethean. Now we come to our melee infantry and first up we have the Zombie Pirates Deckhands Mop. These are a tier 1 unit and are an aquatic meat shield. These are the basic meat shields of the faction and it shows with their stats. They have low armor, melee stats, but shockingly decent weapon damage so if they do manage to hit something, they won't do half bad. They also have a ton of HP so are very difficult to get rid of and fulfill that meat shield role excellently. 
Get mints, hold the enemy still, and throw missiles, magic, and monsters at the opposition to get the damage done. Other than that, don't expect much out of them. They also come in another variation, the Pole Arms Zombie Pirate Deckhands Mop. These are another tier 1 unit and deal anti-large damage, but are still an aquatic meat shield. These guys lose a little weapon strength and attack to gain defense and armor piercing anti-large damage, as well as charge reflection versus large. This makes them into much better line holders as they can keep the enemy back and keep themselves alive much longer than the base unit. They still aren't going to do any real damage versus anything even halfway decent, so still keep the support coming, but they'll do the same job as the regular mob, but even better. Next we have the Sirenes, these are a tier 2 unit, deal armor piercing damage, are ethereal, cause terror, and have enthralling attacks. Ethereal units are always a bit of a weird one for me since they are tough enough versus non-magical damage, but once damage gets high in the late game, they are still just as squishy so it hardly makes a difference. I like to instead use units like these as flankers to get around the enemy front lines using their higher speed and sandwich their melee infantry to break them with their high armor piercing damage and terror. Do this and they should be fine and take a little less damage whilst dealing a whole lot more. Next up we have the Depth Guard. These are tier 3 units, are armored, deal anti-infantry damage and are aquatic. Aside from looking totally badass, Depth Guard are, on paper, a really strong front lines unit. They have high armor, great melee attack and high anti-infantry damage, making them into chaff shredders that can mow down multiple units of enemy infantry with ease. They don't have the best defense stats, so we'll start to fall one against high damage enemy infantry. If you're going to use them, then give them plenty of support and keep them alive and help them take out high damage before it takes them out. And if you're wondering why they're only good on paper, I'll come back to that in a little bit. They also come in another variation, the pole arm depth guard. These are another tier 3 units, are armored and aquatic, but now come with anti-large damage. Similar to the deckhands, they lose some armor and weapon strength for a chunk of defense and some more armor piercing anti-large damage, as well as a charge reflect versus large. This makes them into a much better line holder that can actually keep themselves alive versus most opponents and give your troops plenty of time to deal all the damage and take out the opposition. They'll also deal decent damage themselves with the new armor piercing, but still don't leave them to get on with it on their own, as their defense still isn't outstanding, so they'll still die if left to fend for themselves. Coming to the ranged infantry now, first up we have the zombie pirate gunnery mob, these are a tier 1 unit, are also a meat shield and aquatic, and can fire whilst moving. The first of the ranged units, and I can now explain why the depth guard and pretty much all the frontline's infantry are pretty pointless. When playing as a vampire coast, the focus is on ranged, and every unit has a flat firing arc with very few exceptions. Taking a frontline just means you're forcing yourself to find angles and risk your damage dealers being taken out and shooting your own troops, neither of which are ideal. If you instead take a frontline of ranged troops, then they can fight upon the enemy as they approach, and they are essentially as cheap and will deal much more damage. Yes, they are pathetic in melee, but so are deckhands, so you may as well get some damage out before they go. So, have these guys as the front lines and focus down enemy units as they approach. Once lines clash, of course they will start to die quick, so give them some proper missile, magic and monster support as much as possible, and set them back up to keep them firing and turn the pressure back onto the enemies. They also come in a couple of variations. First up we have the bombers, these are another tier 1 unit, deal anti-infantry damage, and are aquatic. These lads drop a ton of range and ammo in exchange for explosive flaming attacks that excel at doing area damage and taking out clumps of enemy chaff with ease. They have a slight firing arc, but that short range isn't getting over anything's head, so these guys need a clear line of sight to hit their targets. If you use them as a front line off some burst damage right before the enemies hit you, or have them go around flanking the enemy and firing into enemy backs for a massive amount of damage. Just make the most of their low ammo while you have it, as once it's gone, they are fairly useless. The handguns are another tier 1 unit, and now pick up armor piercing missiles. These have a little more range than the regular gunnery mob, as well as armor piercing damage, so can do great damage versus pretty much anything in the early to mid game. They still have a straight firing arc, so need a clear line of sight on their targets, but they're long range means they can get away with a light bit of firing overheads. Still, most of the time you'll need an angle since you want to use these guys as actual backlines. This means getting on the sides or backs of the enemy to get a clear shot. Of course, if they get caught in melee, they're totally useless, so get them out as soon as possible and keep them firing to get the most value. And finally, we have the hand cannons. These are a tier 2 units and also have armor piercing missiles. It says they're anti-large, but they don't have any bonus. I suppose they are kind of good at focusing down anti-large, but any missile units is, but I digress. These have a little more range than the bombers and a ton more ammo as well as great armor piercing damage. This makes me into a great choice for a frontline's ranged units as they can do some great burst versus pretty much anything as they approach your army. They are still useless in melee, so do enough damage that they don't stay in long and get them back to firing as soon as possible as their damage is really that good. You could also use them as flankers if you really wanted, but as I mentioned earlier, the ranged frontline is really the way to go for the coast. And our final ranged units are the deck gunners. These are another tier 2 units, have armor piercing missiles as well as shield breaker which means targets have a reduced chance of blocking subsequent missiles when hit with these. These are your end game backlines missile units. They have massive range and brilliant armor piercing damage so can soften enemies up from half the map away and take a large pound of flesh from them while they do. They are however totally pathetic in melee so if they get caught out, get them out as soon as possible Otherwise, you're going to lose a lot of missile power in just a few seconds. Keep on the back lines raining fire on enemies as they approach before getting onto the flanks of the enemy lines to continue the hail of bullets. Next up, we have the monsters and beasts, and first, we have the felt bats. These are a tier 1 units, and are of course weak versus armor. These are more or less the same as the vampire count, so I'm going to basically say the same thing here. 
alone, these guys are pretty useless since they have no armor, poor melee stats, and not much charge bonus. But if you use them to swarm with multiple units against one enemy, they start to come into their own. Their decent damage allows them to actually burst down enemy backlines when they attack in a large enough number, so send them to swarm single units at a time before pulling out and moving on to the next one. Against anything with even remotely decent melee stats, they will start to lose fast, so reserve this strategy for the early game, but while you have them, they'll do pretty well for you. Next we have the Bloated Corpse, this is a tier 1 unit, causes terror, is aquatic, and has the noxious disintegration and gaseous demise abilities. If these guys engage in melee or fall below 25% HP, they will explode and deal massive damage to whatever is around them. These are one of the most bizarre units in the game, as they are essentially bombers that want to commit the not alive. You want to run these guys into the biggest clump of important enemy units that you can and explode, dealing massive damage to all around them. Make sure you keep away from your own troops, as this explosion knows no allegiance and will wipe you out just as easily. Also, be careful to keep these guys hidden from enemy ranged, as if they fall to a low level of HP, they'll explode no matter where they are, and you'll lose the units for no reason at all. Next, we have Scurvy Dogs. These are another tier 1 unit, are very fast, come with Vanguard deployments, and are still weak versus armor. These are very similar to wolf units from other factions, and they perform pretty much the same. Similar to the bats, alone they aren't much to write home about, but once you send them in groups, that's when they start to get work done. If they surround a ranged unit, they'll wipe them out in record speed, and once they start running, it's game over. Nothing takes out retreating units like wolves, and these are no different, so send them in and plummet the enemy numbers to farm XP and get those army losses. Keep them well away from anything that can fight, and they should do just great. The animated hulks are next up, and these are another tier 2 unit, deal armor piercing anti-infantry damage, and are aquatic. These are the first of the monsters that you can actually consider using in frontline combat. They are decently tough for the early game based entirely on their large HP pool, so as long as they aren't against high armor, they should be okay. You also have pretty high damage with decent melee attack and armor piercing damage, meaning they can take on most early game units of ease and wipe the flow of them pretty easily. Send them in to assist on the front lines and deal great damage to whatever you find there. Of course, if you have a ranged front line, this is even more important to push back attackers and get your troops firing again. Next up, we have Mongols. These are a tier 3 unit and deal armor piercing anti infantry damage, come with Stalk and Vanguard deployments. These are basically like a bunch of small haunters and perform pretty much how you'd expect from that description. They are sneaky with Stalk and Vanguard, so can creep up on most enemies with these and do some pretty tasty damage once they get into combat. They have armor piercing anti infantry damage, so do best versus smaller entities like the backs of the front lines, and this is probably their best use. Use their sneakiness to get around the enemy lines and smash into the backs of their front lines to break them with high damage and fear. Next, we have the Rotting Prometheans. These are a tier 3 units, are armored, deal armor piercing damage, are defenders as well as aquatic. These are a more defensive step up from the animated hulks, as they have less damage but are tankier with high armor, HP, and even defense. They still do decent damage, but nothing out of this world, and as the tooltip says, they are defenders more than damage dealers. These work well as front lines to keep the enemy still in clumps for you, so then fire out with your ranged troops. You can also use them alongside your front lines, whatever they may be, but their damage isn't exactly going to turn the tide later into the game, so you might want to look elsewhere if that's the type of monster that you need. Next we have the Death Street Terrorgeist. This is a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, has poison attacks, has regeneration and the Death Shriek ability. This is the end game flying beast of the Vampire Coast. It of course has high speed alongside massive weapon damage and decent melee stats. This makes it into a beast that you can zoom around the map and provide front lines help wherever needed against pretty much anything. Yes, it's a massive target for range, but that high speed lets you run from missiles or charge in to take them down at the source if you so wish. Just make sure you don't leave them to get focused from range or melee, as they will still go down the late game despite their defense and armor stats. And our final monster is the Rotting Leviathan. This is a tier 3 unit, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, is a defender as well as aquatic. And this is your endgame frontline's ground based monster. It is obscenely tanky for a single entity, with nearly 10,000 HP alongside a massive armor and great melee stats. On top of this wall of defense, it also deals excellent damage with massive weapon strength, pretty strong attacks, as well as range damage that will keep firing at pretty much the entire battle long. You want to get this guy into the middle of the enemy front lines and take on as many infantry units as the enemy can throw at him while supporting him with missiles and magic. If the enemy has missiles of their own, especially armor piercing, take them out as soon as possible because a hitbox this thick makes him an easy target. Now we have the missile monsters and beasts. First up we have deck droppers, these are tier 1 units and can fire whilst moving. They're essentially a flying gunnery mob with decent but not very armor piercing damage combined with high speed flying. This allows them to get into all sorts of locations your regular ranged troops can't and rain fire on the enemy from pretty much any angle you can think of. Of course being in the air does make them an easy target for enemy ranged and any other flying units. They can run from range but enemy flyers are going to clap them pretty much no matter what since their melee stats are just so poor. Keep them on the move and away from flyers and ranged and they'll do great shooting in the backs of the front lines. They also come in a couple of variations. The bombers deal anti-infantry damage, these drop some range, ammo and damage to gain explosive flaming missiles that will do great work versus clumps of less armoured enemies. They still want to be used pretty much the same as the base units only now target unarmored clumps instead. 
Still avoid the same stuff and they'll do just fine. We also have handgun deck droppers. These have armor piercing missiles and deal anti-infantry damage. Again, they can be used the same as the base units, but now have more range and armor piercing, so we'll do great work versus pretty much anything. Use them the same to get those angles and focus down the highest value tags on the enemy side. Avoid flyers and ranged and you're golden. Next we have the rotting Promethean gunnery mob. These are a tier three units, deal armor piercing damage, are defenders, aquatic and can fire whilst moving. These are literally the same as the base unit, but now I've gonna sat on them to provide some armor piercing ranged fire while they're fighting. You can use them pretty much the same as long as you keep them fighting as that armor piercing damage will really help their output. They're still great line holders, but will now soften up units on their approach as well as hold them in place once they hit. Not much more to say, they are the same unit as before, but they now have guns, so are better. And our final missile monster is the Necrofex Colossus. This is a tier 3 unit, has armor piercing missiles, armor piercing melee, causes terror and can fire whilst moving. These are the units you think of when you picture the Vampire Coast, and for good reason. They are the strongest units in the roster, and that's a pretty decisive number 1 victory royale. Yet enemies you're about to go down. It has a massive missile strength and a huge range, so basically functions as a cannon artillery piece that can fire over anything's head, since it's just so tall. This makes it great versus large single entities on the enemy force, as that massive damage goes straight to their HP and leaves quite a mark. They're also outstanding in melee combat with super high damage again and area attacks to spread it to anything nearby. Of course, they are large targets so can be focused down by ranged, but if you remove them from the equation, there is very little that can stop these guys. Bring them in and have them fire until enemies close in, and then send them in to wipe the floors with anything the enemy throws at you with ease. Now come to the artillery and war machines. First up we have the mortars, these are tier 2 units and deal anti-infantry damage. These are your bog standard mortar units with great range to fire explosive projectiles that do great damage versus less armoured chaff. They are one of the few units with firing arc so can shoot over the tops of heads, no problems to hit their targets. Have them shoot at the largest clumps of enemy infantry you can to spread that damage around and pick up a ton of kills. Don't let them get caught in melee, as they will die in moments. Keep them safe and they'll do great. Now our other artillery piece are the Carronades. These are another tier 2 unit, deal armor piercing missiles and a great versus large. These are another pretty bog standard cannons unit. They have a flat firing arc so are harder to get a clean shot with than the mortars. They deal armor piercing damage but their explosions are not as large so hit multiple entities is much harder. I would use these lads to focus down large single entities on the enemy side with that massive damage hitting their HP bar entirely. If you can't get a shot, then try to get an angle, but quite like the mortars, they will die if caught in combat, so keep them safe whenever possible, and fire from a secure spot. Now I have a couple of faction unique units. First up we have the Sartosa Free Company, these are a tier 1 unit, deal anti-infantry damage, come with vanguard deployments, aquatic, and the rowdy ability. These are the first of two units that you can only recruit as RNS Assault Spite, who of course leads the Sartosa faction. And they are a pretty nice addition to a faction with no real front line. They're also one of the few units that isn't undead, so once they lose leadership, they'll just start running rather than disintegrating. They deal nice anti-infantry damage, but not much armor piercing, so do great versus large clumps of low armor infantry units. They work nicely as a front line and actually will do some damage in the early game, but later on their damage will drop off and they'll become a bit more useless since they aren't the most defensive. Next up with the Sartosa Militia. These are a tier 1 unit, are a hybrid unit, decent melee combatant, come with vanguard deployments, aquatic and rowdy. These are basically a Vampire Coast version of the Free Company Militia. They are hybrid weapons infantry that deal some decent damage with a short range missile, as well as not being too horrific in melee either. This jack of all trades does end up making them a master of none, and as such they won't do amazingly in either role. Super early on, they'll do fine if you spam them, but once you have other units, you can replace them with units from the OG roster. Next up the Damned Knights Errant. These are a tier 2 unit, are shielded, deal anti-infantry damage and are ethereal. They also have access to the Lance Formation, which increases their charging stats and causes them to form a Lance, which helps them pierce formations, but does mean less units get their full charge off most of the time. These next three are all summonable using Silostra's Ghost of the Past ability once it's been upgraded with skills, and as such you need to use them fast before they return from whence they came. For these guys, they're shot calves, so summon them somewhere they can get a charge off immediately and do it as many times as you can before they go. If you can get them between multiple units, even better for that efficiency, but other than that, there's not much to it. Next we have the Damned Knights of the Realm. These are a tier 3 units, are shielded, deal anti-large damage, are ethereal, and have lance formation. You want to use these just like the Knights Errant, but now they have more charge bonus. Enjoy a couple of rounds of cycle charging with some massive impacts before they go, and that's honestly just about it. And finally, with the Damned Questing Knights. These are a tier 3 unit, deal armor piercing, anti-large damage, are ethereal, and have lance formation. These are a little bit different since they are more of a sustained combat carve, so you can send them in and leave them in. Of course, their charge will get them a little extra power on the initial impact, but is it worth it for that limited time you have them for, or are you better off leaving them in to keep that damage climbing the whole time? Now we come to the Regiments of Renown. I'll call out each regiment, what it's a unit of, and the differences between it and the base unit. The Tide of Skjold are a zombie pirate's deckhands mob and gain increased attack, frenzy, and rowdy. The Bloody Reaver Deck Guard are a Depth Guard pole arms unit and gain the Enrage ability and the Hunger. The Black Spot are a Handgun Zombie Pirate Gunnery Mob unit and gain increased attack, defense, and weapon strength as well as charge reflection versus large. 
the Shade Wraith Gunners are deck gunners and gain increased melee stats, reduced HP, armor, and missile strength, but become ethereal, so lose all armor, but gain 55% physical resistance. The Night Terrors are Mongols units and gain increased leadership, attack, weapon strength, and charge bonus, but reduce defense, as well as gaining terror and rampage. The Salt Lord Scuttlers are bomber deck droppers and lose some missile strength, but gain armor sundering attacks. The Lampreys Revenge are rotting Promethean gunnery mob and gain expert charge defense and regeneration. The Gallows Giants is a Necrofex Colossus unit and gains increased defense, weapon strength, and missile strength at the cost of a reduced range, as well as gaining flaming attacks and missiles with the burnt contact effect. And finally, we have Queen Bess. She's her own unit and she don't need no base units. She's one of the best RT units in the game and can do a massive amount of damage to clumps with huge explosive missiles and a large firing arc. Sear at the back, feed her ammo with gunnery whites, and watch the fireworks as she racks up kills and damage with ease. Now we come to the army compositions. In Warhammer 3, every unit has a tier from 1 to 3, and I'm going to be using these tiers to make you armies for the early, mid, and late game so that you are set for every single step of your campaign. First up, we have tier 1. In this army, we're going to be leading it with a pistol vampire fleet admiral with the lore of the vampires. For our front line, we're going to have six bomber gunnery mob. For our back line, we're going to have six handgun gunnery mob. And we're going to have four scurvy dogs and three fell bats. Well, let's go for the pistols since they can do okay in combat if they really need to, but they can still do work on the back lines if they aren't needed on the front. Alongside this, the lore of the vampires is never a bad thing, so they're a great choice. The bomber mob for the front line can be hard to use, with you ending up taking a lot more casualties than you might need, but if you can manage to use them correctly, you'll be dealing a ton of damage as the enemy make their initial approach. The handguns are of course the best choice for a second line of ranged troops with their massive range allowing them to snipe enemies from afar and rack up a ton of kills and damage. They're also great versus single entities and characters if they can focus fire, so don't be afraid to pinpoint one target if it needs to take him down. Scurvy Dogs are going to do great work in the back lines like any early game wolf units and can come back and wipe out retreating units whenever you need them to. And finally, the bat's going to help out with the back lines and blitz down targets one at a time that the dogs might not be able to reach in a good time. Come to tier 2, still have that pistol vampire fleet admiral with the lore of the vampires. We're going to pick up a gunnery white and a vampire fleet captain with the lore of the deeps. We're going to upgrade our front line to 5 hand cannons and then we're going to upgrade our second line to 5 deck gunners. We're also going to pick up 3 animated hulks, 2 mortars and 2 carronades. That lord should have their spells and mount by now so be a powerful force on the battlefield, decently tank it and be supporting your troops with magic whenever needed. Gunnery White won't have too much impact to start off with, but once they get those abilities on the go, they'll be buffing ranged units and they'll get a ton of value and do some okay damage themselves. Our final heroes will bring that lore of the deeps because it's too much fun to not use, plus it deals some great damage and has some pretty nice buffs and debuffs that fit well with the playstyle. Upgrading to hand cannons for our front line since the extra damage and armor piercing makes them much better into the late game and allows them to take on great swords and take them out before they even get close. Also going to upgrade to deck gunners on the back line since they are unmatched their range and damage, so it's a no-brainer. They'll still be able to snipe pretty much anything they can see and deal massive damage when they do. The hulks are going to assist against anything that makes it close to your lines and deal decent damage whilst also leaving gaps for missile units to shoot through to keep up the pressure. And finally, the mortars and carronades are going to focus on infantry and single targets respectively, and both will do great work for you, more or less into the late game if needed. And finally, we come to tier 3, still being led by our fleet admiral, still got the gunnery whites and the vampire fleet captain, and we still have the 5 hand cannons and the 5 deck gunners. Changing our monster line, however, as we've got two rotting leviathans, one death shriek terror guys, and we're going to swap out the carronades for the necrofex colossuses. No real change to the lord since they can only get one mount, but grab them some skills to buff themselves and the army when you're in campaign. The gunner and white should have all their abilities and a mount by now, so be excellent buffing heroes that can catapult already powerful ranged units to the next level. The vampire fleet captain should also have spells and a mount and be slinging spells and fighting where needed to keep your line safe and the enemy in pieces. No change to the front and back line since they're as good as they can get. We're going to go for the Rotten Leviathan as our front line's monsters, as they are going to protect your front lines from flanks or units that make it to them with their huge damage and tankiness, and land them to take on pretty much anything. The Death Shriek is going to be your backline's monster and speed over enemy armies to take out missile troops in the back with ease before flying away to safety once they spot danger. Keep the breath ability coming and they'll do great work. We're going to swap the Necrofex in for the Carronades since they can do the same job but better as well as being badass frontline's monsters. And you can't really go wrong with them, so keep them shooting and send them in whenever needed. And that is everything you need to know on how to play the Vampire Coast in battle. We've got the Norska campaign guide coming next Friday, so subscribe if you want to see that. We're hoping to hit 50k by the end of the year, so I would appreciate the assistance. If you enjoyed this video and or found it useful, then consider dropping a like. If you really enjoyed the content and want to support it directly, then consider becoming a member on YouTube or a Patreon on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power and discounts on merch, as well as shoutouts at the end of videos, just like Henry Tucker, his spot at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters, and one last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Dumbers, and I will see you next turn.